coming up on this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. All aboard the Nintendo Welcome Wagon! It's dangerous to go alone, so the Nintendo Cartridge Society goes with you. Welcome to Nintendo Cartridge Society. I'm your host, Patrick Ellers, and I'm joined, as always, by the other host, Mark Mitchell. How's it going, Mark? It's going good. Um, So I, I'm working from home right now, like mm. uh, a lot yes. of people are, and I'm realizing it's the perfect opportunity for me to totally change like my persona, like to have a sort of like Sandy and Grease type transformation when I return to work. Absolutely. Well, wait, for when you return to work or just something to like relish in while you're home and like <laughs> no, no one's going to make fun of you? No. When I, oh, actually, I mean, that's a great point. If I was ever mm-hmm. going to grow my hair out, which, by the way, would look horrible, now would be the time <laughs> to do it, right? 100%. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know if you are saying this because you can see that I have shaved uh, down to just the mustache. Um, but uh, I normally have like a, just a, a, a fine layer of stubble to uh, occasionally it borders on being a beard. Um, but like I have just gone uh, clean on everywhere but under my nose um, today. I did it today because I was like, I don't know. I'm bored. So I guess I'll <laughs> shave. We can pretty much be whatever we want now. I think here's the problem is we have to do pretty much whatever we want because we can't do any of the normal stuff. Yeah, that's so true. Speaking of normal stuff that we can't do, the Sonic Forces borrowing program currently on hiatus um, until I feel comfortable sending something through the mail um, just to strangers and then getting it back in my house and then sending it out to other strangers. So I don't know when that'll be, but uh, sometime in in the future. But oh, that doesn't wa- mean that. Yes, exactly. If you want to get on the list to borrow it at some point in the future, you should still email us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at gmail.com and give us a mailing address, and then we can uh, put you on a list to maybe someday uh, get your hands on this thing. Also, in just a few precious weeks, we're going to be starting our retro month of April by playing SNES Classics all month long every Thursday, starting with The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past on April 2nd. And if you want to participate in that show, we would love to hear like your most memorable moments from that game. Um, it, bo- uh, all the games we're going to be playing in April are available on the SNES Classic or on the SNES Switch Online. So play along with us and send in your thoughts on any of the games we're playing. We're going to be playing uh, Super Metroid after the Link to the Past on April 9th. And then on April 16th, we're going to be talking about Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island. And then on April 24th, we'll be talking about Star Fox. Um, so that's uh, all super fun. And I want, every- I want everyone to participate. <laughs> everyone should be playing along. Look, we've got nothing but time, right? Um, and it's been nice and luxurious for me to just play uh, Link to the Past um, like during the day or like too late at night uh, because I don't have to wake up for anything in the morning. <laughs> Uh, so we'd love for uh, uh, people to play along. Okay, so we have two topics to get into this week. Um, we are going to be uh, answering a listener question about like a great first year of Nintendo games. But first, we have got a uh, the Indie World Showcase that we are, are that we're going to uh, recap and talk about. Um, so let's do that. Let's get into the Indie World Showcase. <laughs> Okay, Mark, first broad strokes. How did you feel about the, the showcase on uh, tu- Tuesday? Tuesday. Tuesday. So I realize I'm beginning to have a complicated relationship with the Indie World showcases as of late. Because you used to date? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Damon Baker and I. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, no, so I, I feel like they're kind of stuck in this interesting area where 
previously the Indie World showcases were exciting kind of because we knew what was coming. Like all of the indie games that we loved from other platforms would be announced for Switch. And that was super exciting that we'd be able to play them on our Switch. But now they're kind of like games that from studios we don't really know that they might turn out to be good, but also they might turn out to be really bad. Like it's just like really difficult to get excited for some of them because you're like, that looks cool, but what if it's not any good? Yeah, I mean, that that is tough. I, th- I do think that uh, there are a bunch of these um, games that we're seeing uh, from um studios that are that are interesting studios or developers that are interesting developers um that still that like are kind of high profile but uh are also like there there's a game from Sweary in here right like there it's not everything is um like a totally faceless developer there's also a hello games game in here um and yeah the thing that i think is interesting is that we are starting to see now um like sequels to big indie games um like you know this one closed out with a sequel to enter the gungeon appropriately titled exit the gungeon um and i think the previous one ended with axiom verge 2 right right um so like yeah it's uh we're kind of like looping around on like we're not just seeing the indie games that we expect to see come to switch but we're starting to see um sequels to those things um but then also on top of that sort of there's like another category where it's like here's a game from a develop a game you know nothing about uh from a developer you know nothing about and i almost wish they could drill down into them like it was an honest to goodness nintendo direct yeah totally um because a couple of these games especially right up front seem really interesting um like it, so it kicks off with this game called uh blue fire which is coming out in summer 2020 and is a timed console exclusive a phrase that they were throwing around throughout this direct timed console exclusive um and blue fire looks pretty cool right i like think like the trailer was cool but uh yeah like to your point we don't really know anything about it like the trailer for me was i wanted like the trailer then then them to introduce it and then to go like a deeper dive but it's just not like the format of these indie world showcases to do that yeah the kind of the indie world showcases are just about putting the product in front of you and saying it's coming sometime um but like i almost got a little bit of a uh uh remember that game fey from like two years ago fey yeah yeah um like it fey or fe or who who even knows fe um and not not sharp fe it's not tokyo mirage <laughs> sessions <laughs> um where like it's got that uh like super high contrast um like kind of more minimalist art style um but like the it's a 3d action platformer and the you know there's like a lot of like uh, double jumping and like jumping and dashing in the air that seemed um i don't know that blue fire seemed like a cool game and like i just want to know more about it and i'm bummed that i didn't really get that from this yeah um i, I mean to your point about it looking really good even just like aesthetically i thought there were a lot of games in here that fit that bill where like i uh, I feel like it's kind of like a shift in what indie game means nowadays. I totally. feel like for the past, you know, maybe even 10 years, indie games have usually been pixel art and they've been kind of like simple in their uh, display. And so many of the games here are like full 3D rendered, like beautifully rendered games that it feels like mm-hmm. what it means to be an indie title. I mean, there's a, it was in the sizzle reel at the end. There's like a Blair Witch game. And I was like, what? How is this an indie game? Like, like what an indie game is now is yeah. like it could be could mean anything, which is really cool. Yeah, that is cool and interesting, and I wonder what like the actual cutoff is. Like, why is like why isn't uh, Resident Evil Three? Why isn't that an indie game? <laughs> like, I mean, like why isn't it? Just because like why did we decide that Capcom isn't an indie studio? Why? Right. Yeah, I don't know. The line really is getting blurred. Blurred. Like, yeah, Hello Games is an independent publisher, but what does that mean when they had one of the most successful, you know, like PlayStation Four games of the past few years? Yeah, well, and let's talk about that game. Uh, it, it, that's uh, the Last Campfire, which is coming um, out in the summer. Um, and so, Hello Games, uh, Mark was alluding to their uh, 
like huge game is uh, No Man's Sky, um, which was originally a, a PlayStation exclusive and I, I believe is on uh, Xbox now, right? Oh, I'm not sure. I, I think it is. Um, I, but I could very well be wrong. Um, but, you know, uh, No Man's Sky was a like procedurally generated huge explore the universe in a spaceship kind of game. Um, but uh, The Last Campfire, by contrast, it seems like a much more confined, intimate adventure. Um, it's like a, a 3D puzzle platformer, which is right up my alley. A moody 3D puzzle platformer. If it's like sad Captain Toad. <laughs> I know, I know. I was kind of um, reminded of a tweet that was going around in January from uh, a writer from Rick and Morty, uh, Siobhan Thompson, who's like, oh, there are like three types of games. Um, one is like, uh, oh, you're, it's like a first person shooter, like you're a shooter boy type thing. Second uh-huh. one is like, oh, I get it. It's a metaphor for depression. And the third type of game is Nintendo. And like, uh, this game, again, looks really good. But I'm I almost feel like this sort of like moody indie game that's mm-hmm. about connecting with people is becoming like a cliche of its own. It's basically it's the new like Metroidvania. Uh that, I mean that is a great point. We don't see any Metroidvanias in this list, right? <laughs> like Right. It, it, it has been usurped by a 3D platformer where uh you have to empathize with all the characters. <laughs> Uh, so uh, we'll just kind of run down um, some of the other games that were uh, announced here um, and talk about them real quick. Um, there's a game called Baldo that is an, an action RPG that looks... Uh, this one looks super... Like, the visual style was really nice. It looked like mm-hmm. anime, um, but like uh, movie-quality anime, uh, almost like Studio ghibli Um there's this uh, game called I Am Dead where you play as like a ghost who maybe like runs a museum on an island. <laughs> and you're like looking at people's stuff to try to solve puzzles. This, this I, I was intrigued by this one for sure. Um, yeah, it seems very uh, like uh, Return of the Oberdin or, you know, like that sort of um, With like more humor. It, yes, definitely. Um, also, I mean, the title is I Am Dead. Which, like, if there's a better titled game for the moment that we find ourselves in, I can't <laughs> think of one. Uh, next up was Bark, which is a like family friendly, uh, cute shmup that's coming out. Um, and which look which oh. looks cute. Uh, I I wonder how like they they say it's family friendly, but like any game that's uh, like bullet hell, like how much fun is that really for kids? You know what I mean? Uh hi. Uh, up, up next was Freak Apocalypse, which is coming summer 2020, another time console exclusive. This is a uh, Cyanide and Happiness, the webcomic uh, adventure game. Yeah, um, I tell you what, I did not care for this part of the presentation where <laughs> the uh, Cyanide and Happiness guy is like interviewing one of the characters from it. Yeah, it, wa- it wasn't really my thing either. I don't know. There Again, there was just like something about this one where the seams of the presentation were showing a little bit more where it was like a little too obvious that they had just like contacted developers and were like, Hey, shoot a video talking about your thing. We'll stitch it all together in this like one presentation. Um, and yeah, this was seg- a segment that like went on a little bit too long. Yeah. Yeah. Just it's like, like, wasn't really for I, me. I get that the, that I get that like the game itself is probably full of that like style of humor and like those bits so maybe we actually were getting like a taste of what freak apocalypse feels like but if that's Mm -hmm. the case i have no interest in playing it this next one though summer in mara uh another time time console exclusive for uh spring 2020 this time it's like a 3d farming exploration game it just seems really pleasant uh which it like again what i'm craving right now are just like worlds that I can escape to that uh, I want to live in. And this one seems like a world that like, yes, that is where I want to be right now. Absolutely. Uh, On the flip side of that, the next game is called Quantum League, um, which is coming out sometime this year. Um, And it's a time traveling competitive shooter. So like uh, every time you like go out. So I don't know if I can totally wrap my head around it. But uh, I think it's that you're in like a competitive shooting arena 
and when you die like you reset to like the beginning and you have like a ghost basically that recreates your exact movements from your previous play so that like if you want to try to surround someone you can do it by like in your first game you go around to the left and then you die and then the second time you go around to the right and then you're technically on both sides um but that seems like a that seems hard to for me at any rate to like actually use and it will seem like there's just a lot of chaotic bots running around (laughs) yeah the idea sounds really cool and if they're able to like uh make that mechanic approachable i think it could be really fun um and hopefully I, i feel like these types of games are really hard because unless a you know unless there's a lot of people who are playing then these online shooters are it's really hard to like get into one of those if there's no community around it Um, yeah it it makes me think of the the one from one of the earlier indie showcases what is it called the where you would like shoot uh body parts and they would like grow or shrink yeah i i could i can't remember the name but that was exactly my thought too where it kind of has like a day of the dead type look to it and then as people like did better they they're they became more of a target because like their head got bigger their arm got bigger and again that was another one where the mechanic seems really fun but i think it had a kind of troubled launch and they tried to you know like reboot it a few months later but it's just one of those things where it's you if you don't get a community around it um it's going to be hard to be successful yeah you know to me both of these actually sound like good modes in other multiplayer shooters right Mm -hmm. like if if Fortnite had a quantum league mode that like people would be into it and they would play it um but like that they're ne- the underlying shooter uh game has to be uh good and something people are already engaging with um but i mean it you know it's it's a cool concept next up was the good life by sweary developer of Deadly Premonition and Deadly Premonition 2, which is coming to Nintendo Switch. We I saw keep forgetting about that. <laughs> yeah, we saw Deadly Premonition 2 revealed in a previous Indie World showcase, I think. Um, so honestly, uh, th- this game itself looks cool. Uh, you have to solve a murder as a lady. You uh, can ride around on a sheep and turn into a cat. It's like a, you know, like the perfect English town, but underneath there's something going on. Yes. Uh the, I I'm fascinated having never played Deadly Premonition. I'm fascinated by the following that Sweary has in the sense that Deadly Premonition when it came out was a very divisive game. Um you know, some places I think Destruct- Destructoid gave it a 10 out of 10. Other places were giving it like a 2 out of 10 <laughs> just because it was very uh you know like over the top and the combat was janky, but it's has uh, even at the time, it had like a real appreciation and people have a fondness for it. And so it's interesting to me that he, is, having not played any of his games, that he has become so beloved for a game that, you know, is just kind of like, uh, I don't know, hard to wrap my mind around. Yeah, well, I mean, I think he, he occupies a similar space in like the game dev world as like Suda 5.1. Where mm, like mm-hmm. even if even if the game is a little bit janky or um like not not to your specific like aesthetic, um that uh, the vision for the game is so clear and so unique that like you you know you're playing a Sweary game or you know you're playing a a, a Suda Fifty One game. And after that, we saw the Last Campfire from Hello Games, which we had talked about before. And then next was Pixel Junk Eden 2, which is coming out this summer, which I am really excited for because I... Did you ever play Pixel Junk Eden on the PS3? I've never played any Pixel Junk game, period. It's the only one that I've played, and I still have the soundtrack on, like, my phone from the first game. Oh, really? It's, yeah, it's really good. And so... Uh, and I have such fond memories of um, playing it with my friend. And so... Uh, the fact that there, there's a sequel coming out after all these years it has to have been over a decade at this point since the first yeah. game was released. That uh, you know, it 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 made me really happy to see it. Uh, next up was uh, a card-based strategy game called Feria, which is coming out in March. 
Um, and we don't have a lot of March left, so it's got to be coming out soon. Um, they were boasting a, a big single player campaign and then also like co um, competitive and co-op modes. Uh, and then after that, we saw a game called Eldest Souls. Um, and you have to imagine that they uh, picked the word souls because they want people to think that this is a Dark Souls-like game, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, even in the narration, they were talking about how it was like, you know, like difficult and yeah. gritty and all about loadouts. Uh, I also feel like it, it's like a mashup of two things people love. Because I know Eldest is not exactly Elder, but <laughs> it sounds very similar to Elder Scrolls. Yeah, um, you're right. <laughs> so I, I think it's a very strategically picked name. Um, and then, uh, then we'd got like the uh, the sizzle reel of um, indie titles, including the Blair Witch uh, game that we uh, mentioned. Mark, you highlighted two more from from the sizzle reel. Yeah, there were two that I uh, was interested in. So first is Sky from that game company, who also made Journey. Uh, Sky is available on iOS and Android right now. Uh, I haven't played it, but I played Journey and loved that game on the PS3. And so when this comes to Switch, I'm really interested in playing this one. And then the other thing that they showed, which uh, was just a brief trailer or just a brief clip, was did you, this game super liminal. And it looked so interesting to me because it looked like it was all about solving puzzles, but the puzzle had to do with like uh, yes, perspective yes. and like proportions and all that kind of stuff. Like they showed like somebody picking up like a dollhouse off of a table and then moving it across the room and uh, suddenly it was like full size and... You know, like all that kind of stuff like that yeah. seems uh, like it could be a really fun challenge. Did we see Superliminal at like a, a previous Nintendo Direct or maybe like it was in a um, a state of a PlayStation state of play or something? I feel like I had seen that game featured somewhere else before. M might have been uh, even at E3 last year. Yeah, maybe it was. I think it was new to me. I remember that there was a puzzle game on the Switch eShop that was maybe on other platforms, like, um, that was also all about perspective, but I think it was, like, a 2D-type puzzle game. I wish I could remember exactly what it was called. But it was super, super Liminal specifically was new to me, as far as I okay. remembered. Um, and then the whole presentation closes out with Exit the Gungeon, um, the sequel to the enormous hit Enter the, the Gungeon. Uh, Mark, have you ever played Enter the Gungeon? No, it it would it's just way too, it would be way too hard for me. It would be way <laughs> way way too hard. It looks uh Exit the Gungeon is actually the most that I've ever seen like gameplay of this sort of thing and it looks like a ton of fun. It looks really stylish, but um I just know that I would be so bad at it. So my understanding of Enter the Gungeon is that it's it's like a top-down perspective. Um and Exit the Gungeon appears to be more like side scrolling. Oh, interesting. Um, so it, it seems like that's the big, uh, like, uh, the big departure here is that like, it's, uh, switching up the perspective, but that a lot of the, um, gameplay of, uh, the sort of like procedurally generated stuff and, um, like, you know, crazy weapon combinations and, uh, boss fights and stuff that all that is basically coming back, but in a slightly shifted perspective. The only time I ever experienced Enter the Gungeon in any capacity was, at E3 two years ago, um, when I like needed a break from the show floor and went to uh, the Devolver Digital like parking lot party, um, and they had a like on the wall of like some warehouse downtown, they were just projecting Enter the Gungeon, and they were just like two eight year olds playing this game, <laughs> <laughs> and it looked okay. I don't know. Um, okay, so. Uh, do we have any final thoughts here on what uh, what our takeaway is from the Indie World Showcase? Uh, I think I'm ready for a real direct. I think that was kind of my main takeaway. Yeah, no, me too. I I'm very much ready for it. I'm also, yeah, I'm just I'm just very ready for for a a real, full, general Nintendo direct. I feel like a little kid who's like. Uh, at the movies and like squirming through the trailers and everything where it's just like i am ready for the feature presentation at this point um i was thinking about this earlier today and it's got to be that they like have had one ready for a little while but didn't want to tip their hand before animal crossing came out mm. that like if people are starved for like new nintendo stuff 
when Animal Crossing comes out, they're going to snatch it up. And then like a week later, they can be like, and here's what we're doing for the rest of the year. Then you can say, oh, okay, I guess I didn't need to rush out and get Animal Crossing. (laughs) I mean, I don't think you are wrong because Animal Crossing has been like in the top two, if not the top seller in the U.S. eShop since it was available for pre-order like a couple of weeks ago so people are hungry so if that was in fact their strategy i think it is a successful strategy yep you got us again nintendo uh all right let's let's close out this section and that brings us to uh, an email that we got from a uh, a newer listener, um, Christian. Christian uh, Mahone, thank you for uh, writing in. I just wanted to read his question here, Mark, if you will allow it. Um, he says, I wanted to ask your personal opinions on what game to play next. I'm newly uh, breaking back into the world of Nintendo. I have Pokemon Shield, all of the 3DS Pokemon games, Breath of the Wild, Cuphead, Smash Ultimate, and the Phoenix Wright Trilogy. Um and Mario Maker 2. I want to break into Fire Emblem as I haven't played any of the games, but I don't know if Three Houses or Awakening would be better entry points. And Breath of the Wild is the only Zelda game I've played, so I'd love to play more of those. I don't know where to start. I also think it might be a good episode, which is what we're doing right now, uh, to kind of lay out good jumping off points for modern Nintendo consoles. Sort of, if you haven't played any Nintendo games but have a Switch and or 3DS, this is what a fantastic first year might look like. Um, So uh, before we launch into what our uh, fantastic first years might look like, um, where would you direct them to go for a Zelda game next? Okay. Well, oh, uh, well. Here's the thing: is that I, rec- Christian, I would recommend you pace yourself with Zelda games. Yes. Um, because Breath of the Wild is pretty much a brand new take on it, but then kind of the older ones follow a very similar similar formula. So I don't know that there's a need to really like binge yourself on Zelda. So my pick for out of the games you listed that you should play next is I think you should transition into playing Super Smash Brothers Ultimate because I think it's like a quintessentially Nintendo game but a totally different experience than you had with Breath of the Wild. Yeah, that that is definitely true. Um oh, man, I, I that's such a good game and you can sink so much time into Smash Ultimate. Um I I think my my immediate like what to do next would be Fire Emblem Three Houses. Um and I think Three Houses is the easiest entry point um to to the series uh not to take anything away from the other fire emblem games and they're gonna come up on my like here's one year of great nintendo stuff um but like three houses is a good one to like sink your teeth into um and you know really have like a full experience with was awakening your first fire emblem game i can't remember yes yeah it was right yeah and three houses is really my first one I, I also recommend Three Houses uh, as the first one to start with, but that's speaking out of ignorance because it's the only one I played, but I loved it. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, let's get into our uh, great first year. So uh, I think we both approach this like a little bit differently, um, but why don't do, would you like to start uh, by walking us through uh, a great first year of Nintendo games? Sure, yeah. So I approach this from the perspective of someone who has never played Nintendo games before and you picked up like a Switch and a 3DS for the first time. And so here's what I would recommend you play. I love and, this. Uh, and so part of this is that for the most part, I mean, I guess I have uh, like a fourth of them are, but for the most part, I tried my hardest to avoid retro games. And the reason for that is because like, I. I definitely think that with indie games, um, especially, yeah, I mean, just like a lot of indie games, they are taking the tropes and like the style and everything from Super Nintendo games. And so I think that people are actually probably more uh, responsive to some of these retro games than they would have been in the past, like in the GameCube era or something, because I think they've kind of come back into fashion. But... For the most part, I think like if you were new to gaming, that trying to go back and play something like A Link to the Past might be a little bit challenging as your entry point to like the Zelda series. So that's the thesis that I'm like 
that my list is predicated on. Sure. That makes sense. So I also tried to like give a game from Nintendo's like tentpole franchises. But I have one more caveat up front. And yes. that's that as much as I love the game, I did not include Splatoon 2 on my list. What? Why? Because I feel like with Splatfest, o- Spl- Splatfest being over with, it's mm. just like harder for me to recommend it. Um, I think it's probably still a great game and has a great community. But there was something about having those like Splatfest every month that really made it feel alive and was like a reason to go back to it. And yeah. I think Splatfest splatoon 3 is probably closer than it is like further away so might as well just <laughs> when wait we get that direct one. finally after Animal Crossing. <laughs> <laughs> okay so um let me just get into it yeah so i'm starting with march i'm starting with this month assuming that somebody just picked up their switch first nintendo console ever and uh don't worry i'm cheating a little bit because i'm saying you should get both animal crossing new horizons mm-hmm but that might be like a you know you're you're going to want to spice that up occasionally. I don't know that you'll want to spend all of your gaming time doing Animal yes. Crossing New Horizons. So a perfect pairing would be Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Very good. <laughs> one very action packed, <laughs> one very chill experience. Both big into collecting and you could spend a billion hours playing either one. Yeah. And my uh, the way I like playing Super Smash Brothers is by pl- hold on, I lo- I lo- I lost your uh, connection, and so I couldn't tell if oh. you were talking <laughs> or if I was talking. Uh, j- just hit hit your mic for me. Okay, now now I'll just edit around this. Okay, um, okay, so jumping into April. On my list, I have Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze because mm. you can't talk about Nintendo without talking about platformers. And I feel like this is a great one to ease you. Not really ease you because Tropical Freeze is a hard game. But if you're playing the, if you're playing the deluxe version, the one for Switch, um, there's a lot of stuff that can help you out through it. And it's just one of my favorite platformers of all time. Moving on to May, I have Snake Pass. No, you did not. Why? <laughs> no, you're right. I didn't. I'm just kidding. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so May is another month where I'm doubling up, and I'm saying uh, Breath of the Wild at this point. But also, Breath of the Wild is such like a, um, for me, it was such a solitary experience of like exploration and all that kind of stuff that yes. I think it, a, a good pairing is snipper clips. Sure, you're kind of just recreating your first month with the, <laughs> <laughs> the Switch right there. Yeah, and I mean, it was a great first month. Yeah, I would uh, wish it on anybody. <laughs> so uh, after like the big like meaty uh, exercise of Breath of the Wild, again, something just a little bit more fun that you can pick up. That's how I kind of have to balance games. And so uh, for June, I have Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Mm-hmm. July, I have the first um, retro game on my list, which is Super Metroid. Still, I think, the like perfect Metroid experience. That's interesting that uh, I, I didn't realize that you'd be putting like actual retro games, not just like retro, not just avoiding retro styled games, but like mm, mm-hmm. he, here's a genuine game from 1993. <laughs> I guess that one of the reasons that I picked Super Metroid is. Because, yeah, it is a retro game, but so many, like, modern indie games are just built on the same formula. They basically just are doing totally. Super Metroid. Um, so I kind of feel like it's uh, aged really well. So even if you are new to Nintendo games, it won't feel so, like, old or foreign, I guess, was my thought. Plus, uh, we're going to be playing it on April 9th, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that. exactly. Uh, next in August, I have Super Mario Odyssey. Mark, I also have Super Mario Odyssey in August. <laughs> the thing is, Super Mario Odyssey would not necessarily be my pick to introduce somebody to 3D Mario, <laughs> but uh, it's on Switch, and it's a great game. Yes, it is. So September, I have another uh, retro game, and this is Kirby Superstar. 
which is available on the uh, SNES Switch Online. Um, this one, I think multiplayer is a must. And of the games I'm recommending, this is the one that like I will hedge my bets the most because I have such fond memories of playing this game like 20 years ago. So yeah. how well does it hold up now? I can't really say, but in my mind, it's like the perfect Kirby game. Um, in October, I have Fire Emblem Three Houses. Again, after a few like shorter experiences, it's time to dive into something meaty. Yeah. Uh, the fall here is pretty meaty in general. I next I have let uh the first 3DS game on this list, Legend of Zelda: Ocarina of Time 3D. Amazing. And, then, and I think Ocarina of Time 3D is such a good. It's it's on my uh list here too. Um, but it's such a good uh like marriage of like classic game with like new game uh upgrades. Um it's sort of the best of the Nintendo 64 era and the best of the 3 uh the uh, 3DS era at the same time. Yeah, and I also feel like it's a really good like quote unquote modern entry point to older Zelda games because totally. the format of it is so a link to the past in 3D that you know if you like this then you can go even deeper and you could play some of the older Zelda games. I just feel like it's a, like you said it's a really good marriage of like the modern yeah. and the old. Uh in December I have Pokemon Sword or Pokemon Shield, your choice. Of course Pokemon Shield is the better version, but nope, play you know, it's sword, up to play you. sword. Well, sword's the better <laughs> game. Don't let Mark lie to you. Uh <laughs> just as just someone, don't start Sobble. Just don't start Sobble. Just right. Yes. That's the one promise you have to make. Um I I you know, as more of a casual Pokemon fan, I just feel like Pokemon Sword or Shield is the one to get if uh, you haven't played one before. January, I have my final Well, actually that's not true. January, I have uh another retro game, Super Mario World. Uh, this one was tough for me. I was trying to think of like an older 2D Mario game that I would put on the list. And as much as I love Super Mario Brothers 3, I do wonder if you are new to Nintendo games and you started gaming in like a more modern era, if you would find Super Mario Brothers 3 a little bit underwhelming. Sure. Sure. Uh, you, the whole time you'd be like, hey, where's Yoshi? And you'd be right to ask that question. <laughs> And, like, the levels are, you know, like, short. They're not bad, but they're just, like, shorter. Um, yes. I just feel like Super Mario World did it a little bit better in those regards. And then, finally, in February, I have Dr. Mario. Because you have to have a puzzle game on here, and Dr. Mario is just so good. Uh, yeah, that's great. Uh, Mark, that, that is a great first year of Nintendo gaming. Um, so... Uh, two two ways that w w our lists are different. Um, one is that I was not nearly content to do uh, one game at a time. I was assuming someone enthusiastically uh, chasing a new Nintendo habit. <laughs> um, and the, the second thing is, uh, I think just from the way that Christian poses question, I was assuming that the person had already played Breath of the Wild. That like they got the Switch because of Breath of the Wild and then we're like, okay, now what do I do with like my next year with this thing? I don't know why I assumed that, but I did. The other thing I assumed uh, was not a March to February year, but an April to March year. <laughs> oh, well, that will change everything. That'll change everything. <laughs> uh, and then I guess uh, the, the, uh, the last thing... Oh, no, th those are all the things. Okay. Um, so the very first thing is to lay down a foundation. There are three, ge three games that you must download right away, and then you will play them all year long, uh, just whenever you need to fill gaps or need a break from what you're currently playing. Those games are Tetris 99, Pocket Card Jockey, and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. Because I Mario, mean, yeah, go ahead. I, oh, I was just gonna say. I mean, these are good, good picks, and uh, I'm glad that we're getting a little bit of both. I had Doctor Mario on mine, and you have Tetris 99 on yours. Yes, you need to have a game like that. Like, you just need to have something that where you're like, uh, you know, how do I make my mind like bubble for a second? Um, oh, here's something I can play. 
Um, and they're all perfect, like pick up and play experiences, especially pocket card jockey. Um, again, this is a game where you race horses by playing hands of solitaire. It's perfect. Um, but the first game that I start people off with in April is Fire Emblem Three Houses. Because, mm. spoiler, spoiler, my list here is kind of strategy and Fire Emblem heavy. Um, so I'm starting with a big meaty experience in Fire Emblem Three Houses. That's um, bold. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, but I, it is such an easy game to, like, uh, dig into and, like, get sort of lost in. Um, and, you know, if you want more from the game, like you can keep, you can do just like one playthrough. And even that is going to be like a long, you know, like 60 hour RPG experience. Um, but if you want to do, you know, uh, three different playthroughs and the DLC, like there's just so much there. Yeah, totally. Um, so much so that I'm saying that that can even eke into May if you're still finishing up May, uh, because I introduced two other games into the mix here. Uh, that are WarioWare Gold and Super Mario Party. So this is when you start to uh, like experience some of the more like micro game, mini game stuff that uh, Nintendo is so good at. Um, while you are finishing up Fire Emblem Three Houses. Yeah, I do think it's great that we're both so thoughtfully balancing the years for people. So if you, <laughs> yeah. if you, if you I follow these too. tracks, you know it's like. Um, you know, we're being thoughtful. We're not overloading you. We're not that per- we're not that professor in college who's just uh, you know, giving you too much to do all year long. We realize that some of these are big assignments. I had a an English novel class in college where we had to read 600 pages a week. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 600 pages um the uh one of the things like on the syllabus was like if you or when you fall behind in the reading which you will do not try to catch up skip to the next Uh, assignment (laughs) that's the worst that is the worst when like professors are like look i know this is bad like i know i'm being crappy about this (laughs) yep and that's what it was but it was a good class and i liked it next up is june um, and this is where I refer us to The Legend of Zelda The Ocarina of Time uh, 3D on the 3DS. Um, and I'm giving you the whole month to play it. Um, if you speed through it and you need more, there is more. You can play Majora's Mask, um, which is obviously like a different tonal take on it. But it is dealing with a lot of the same uh, like graphics and you know modern sensibilities as uh, Ocarina of Time. But Ocarina of Time definitely takes um, like precedence to majora's mask yeah i agree for sure uh next we're moving on into july and i'm i'm giving here's the thing july i'm starting like uh, a big a big game that i don't expect you to finish um but it's octopath traveler Mm. um yeah which is a game that i feel like we don't talk about at all anymore um and that no one i know finished but man the first like (laughs) The first, like, 15 hours of that game, super fun. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I was like, are you telling people you don't expect them to finish it because we've never finished it? I honestly, I don't know anyone who's finished it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But also at this time, I I start bringing in this sort of, like, uh, retro-styled indie games. um, And at this point would recommend either The Messenger or Celeste. So, you know, while you're playing uh, these, like, turn-based strategy, this turn-based strategy game in um, Octopath Traveler, uh, that uh, these kind of, like, twitchy platformers um, with, like, a retro vibe to them can sort of be the counterbalance to that. Um, and then in August, uh, as, as, uh, as you did, I am suggesting Super Mario Odyssey. Um, and that's a game that you can certainly spend um, all month playing. Um, but I think this is also the time that you should start if you were interested in uh, Fire Emblem Three Houses and enjoyed that experience, where you should start to dabble in the 3DS ones. And at this point, it really is just like, what kind of game would you like to play? Um, uh, my recommendation would be Fire Emblem Awakening, but Fates is uh, like also very good. And if you got really deep into Three Houses and like the more challenging aspects of it, I would say go with Fates. Um, but Awakening is uh, a little bit more on the like story end. Like if you were really into the 
like the romance and the I guess it's not really romance, but like the relationship building of three houses uh, then pick up uh, awakenings at this point. Then moving into September, you keep playing your Fire Emblem game. And this is where I do say start Splatoon 2. Um, mm, like, mm-hmm. and, and like get into it. Because th- there are two different ways to play Splatoon 2. Um, and, you know, I've done both at different points in my life, uh, both for Splatoon and Splatoon 2, uh, where like you can really get into it and really like, uh, you know, study what, like, what's different about like the guns and loadouts and like, really really love it and spend a lot of time and like get some people to like roll around and be your squad um and like that's what i'm recommending here is like spend a couple weeks obsessed with splatoon 2 yeah i i love that game and i i still love it i haven't gone back to it really since the splatfest ended but i loved i became obsessed with salmon run and they've they added yeah. so many more like maps to salmon run i that was by the end that was like my favorite mode i would just spend so much time doing uh like uh attempt after attempt at salmon run you want to play some salmon run this weekend <laughs> yeah i kind of do i never played it with friends i don't think we should do it <laughs> yeah that'd be fun <laughs> We can use the uh, the Switch online app to chat while we do it. <laughs> no, we can't. No, no we can't. We can't. <laughs> um, this is also where uh, I say uh, if if you need downtime while you are, or you need something to like, some non-Fire Emblem thing to play on the 3DS, this is where you download the Twilight Princess Picross game because it costs you nothing. Um, uh, and you just need to buy it with my Nintendo points. Um, and it is one of the best Picross games I have experienced. This will also be a good just like test for you to determine whether or not you are into Picross because that will determine uh, what happens in the final months of, of, of my list here. <laughs> Can you really pick it up with, is it platinum points? Uh, it's, it's whichever one isn't the one that you get from spending money on the Switch eShop. Oh, yeah, that's platinum points. So a lot of t- yeah. times, like, I, I'm just totally lousy with them because I've never spent them on anything. I should totally download yeah. that. You can buy a game with them. In fact, it's the only way to get it. <laughs> um, and it's amazing. Um, okay, now we are to October. And for the range of October through December, I say you are playing Dragon Quest XI-S Echoes of an Elusive Age Definitive Edition for the Nintendo Switch. You are going to take your time with Dragon Quest XI S Echoes of an Elusive Age Definitive Edition. Any time that feels like a good stopping point for the night, for the day, for the week, you're going to take it. And every time you come back to it, the game is going to very helpfully remind you where you are, what you were doing, and what was important. And it's, it's a super smooth experience. Don't rush through the game. Take your time. Man, I've really got to get back to it. I have only put like maybe an hour in. I started playing it right <laughs> after I finished. I know I only I started playing it after I finished three houses and I just felt so overwhelmed. I was like, I cannot commit to another enormous experience like this. And I've kind of been coasting ever since um, waiting for yeah. Animal Crossing to come out. But you, I know like so many I love Dragon Quest. So many people I know have loved this game. You loved this game. Um, I've mm-hmm. really got to get back to it. Um, but in the meantime, because you're if you're only gonna play the game for like half an hour at a time, and then you know take uh, you know an entire entire weeks off, um, all the rest of these months have other games in them. Um, so October, I'm saying Luigi's Mansion, baby. Uh, spend some time with Luigi's Mansion. It's an adorable uh, little like diorama of a game. Um, so uh, hard recommend that. Um, in November, this is where I say pick up Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. Um, Maybe this, maybe Smash Brothers Ultimate should have been in the uh, like initial list of like games that you just need to have to play like whenever. Um, but I think there's also something nice about like saving the month of November for like really digging into it. Um, also, I make a little note here uh, maybe pick up one of the Box Boy games. All the games are good, but if you're spending mo- most of your gaming time on the um, Switch, then go for Box Boy plus Box Girl. Um, but if you're comfortable on the 3DS, any, any of the rest of them are, are also great. Yeah. And I think you can get all three on the 3DS for pretty cheap. Um, by yeah. themselves, they're not a, that expensive. I think Bye Bye Box Boy was like six bucks, five bucks or something like that. 
Uh, if you're choosing which one to buy based on which one is the most fun to say, I definitely think it's bye bye box boy. Oh yeah, bye bye box boy is certainly the most fun one to say. <laughs> um, and then in December, uh, pick up that Captain Toad's treasure tracker. Um, I, you know, I guess uh, this is sort of a a reprise of uh, the October October recommendation uh, of Luigi's Mansion because it is a cute diorama of a game. Um, but that's uh, whatever. It's a, it's another really good one of those. Um, and then I'm also tossing in here uh, Sonic Mania because um, it's been a little bit since uh, I recommended like an action game in here um, or something that is like a little bit more twitchy um, and uh, you know like fast like that. And Sonic Mania is so I like I Sonic Mania is uh, was such a great moment and I feel like we keep forgetting about it. You know oh I mean? man, yeah. Oh, totally. I loved Sonic Mania. I had never really played a Sonic game before. I had gone to I remember going to a friend's house and they would have a Genesis, but I didn't get Sonic cuz the physics are so different from like Mario platforming. Mm-hmm. And so Sonic Mania was like a revelation to me. I was like, I get why people love Sonic. It was so good. Yeah, I completely second your recommendation. Which gets us through the the end of the year. Now we're in January. And in January, I say, play The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds um, for... Uh, di- did you say Link Between Worlds in, in your No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, so this, you know, is the the only, like, 2D Zelda that I'm, I'm recommending in, in this great first year. Even though I think the 2D Zeldas are all, like, kind of amazing. Um, but Link Between Worlds has... It's it's another kind of example of um, like the sort of classic era, the best of the classic era meeting the best of the modern era. Um, it's just such a such a good solid game, um, and isn't like is deep, but it isn't so long and so all encompassing that it'll feel like too much after um, Dragon Quest. Because um, by January you should have finished Dragon Quest. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then in February, uh, uh, February, I am uh, suggest this is a this is a weird month, and I don't really know why I've done it this way. Um, but I wanted another like strategy game to get back to, so I'm suggesting either Wargroove or Into the Breach. Um, mm. Wargroove, Wargroove, if you're feeling more um, like you want long campaigns of uh, like top down strategy games, and Into the Breach, if you're feeling more uh, like you want bite-sized strategy, like perfect little strategy nuggets. Um, the, and then in addition, the as- yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say that the aesthetic of Into the Breach is so interesting. I really liked the like look of that game. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, giant robots fighting uh, bugs. So like, what's not to like? <laughs> Uh, and then I'm also suggesting uh, any of the drink box games at this point. That's Guacamelee, Guacamelee Two, and Severed. Um, which uh, do you remember? Do you remember uh, Severed? Did you play it, or was it just me playing it like three times in a row? <laughs> I think it was just you playing it three times in a row because it came out on Switch like way later than it came out on other platforms, and you had already played it. But I think did you end up buying it again for Switch as well? Uh, so I think it was uh, 3DS and Wii U. Um, oh, that, like, it man. Came to came to 3DS, and then, like, it came a little bit later to the Wii U, um, but it was, like, cross-buy. So, like, I'd already purchased it one place, um, so I suddenly just had it on the other platform. Um, but, uh, man, Severed, it, both Severed and Guacamelee, like, share a similar art style. Um, but, like, Severed's gameplay... Is like a first person, like sort of dungeon crawler kind of experience. Um, And all of the battles are these like, they're almost like little puzzle rhythm games where you have to like swipe the thing in uh, like certain directions. And it it can feel like at once very um, like puzzly and very actiony at the same time Um, and just feels and looks great. Um, And then Guacamelee is uh, an incredible. Uh, like metroidvania style uh, platformer um, where you get new uh, like fighting abilities and your fighting abilities let you move around the world better and all of the locomotion helps you fight better Um, it's uh, guacamelee is an incredible series of games 
Which brings us, of course, Mark, to March, the final month in my first great year of playing Nintendo games. And this is where I say, what, what did you respond to previously? Right? Like mm-hmm. there, were, there, were, there were a few kind of like test balloons in here. Um, did you enjoy Picross? Then pick up Picross 3D2 and Murder by Numbers. Did you respond to Fire Emblem? Get more Fire Emblem. Or uh, Codename <laughs> Steam, another good uh, intelligent system strategy game. Uh, did you respond more to the retro platformers? Then get Super Meat Boy. Uh, did you respond to the 2D Zelda? Then get uh, the Link's Awakening remake. Um, but I feel like by this point, you have a so- you've played a bunch of good games, uh, and you're start- you've sampled other kind of like mini genres within the like Nintendo oeuvre uh, and can make informed decisions from there. Yeah, th- th- at this point, you're ready to let them out of the nest and they can fly on their own. That's that, and look, that's got to be the goal of this thing all the time, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh. Uh, all right. Uh, that that was fun. That was super fun, and I feel like I could do a totally different list uh, after having done just that one. <laughs> oh you know yeah, I mean? no, I I com- I completely agree. But I do think that we have you know like two very solid tracks that someone who's coming to uh, Nintendo consoles for the first time would be able to follow, and that they would have a great time if they're me or you. Yeah. W- yes. <laughs> Uh, and they would know nothing of F Zero or Star Fox. All right, <laughs> <laughs> let's let's close this out. Those are our recommendations for a great first year with Nintendo. But we would love to hear yours. Um, if you would like to write into us with your list of how you spend your first great year playing Nintendo games, you can write to us at Nintendo Cartridge Society at gmail at gmail dot com. No, let's see Mark, how that you one worked do out. It. I know, okay, but let's we'll see. see. Let's see how close we get. All right. Uh, so whatever, however that lines up, just know that I didn't edit it at all. That's how it lines up. Okay, that's going to do it for this episode of Nintendo Cartridge Society. Remember, you can please rate, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. If you like the episode, you can share it on Facebook or Twitter. On Twitter, I'm at Patrick underscore Ellers. Mark is at MKE Mitchell, and the show is at Name Cart Society. And we also have a Facebook page, which is just Nintendo Cartridge Society. Olivia Duncan made our logo. Our theme music is provided by Ape Betty. You can get more of its music by going to apebetty.com or by listening right now. For my co-host, Mark Mitchell, this is Patrick Eller saying thank you for listening. Have you ever encountered an unexplained hairy bipedal hominid in the woods? Have you received telepathic messages from an unidentified aerial phenomenon? If so, then you need to listen to Bigfoot Collectors Club. I'm Michael McMillan. And I'm Bryce Johnson. And together with super producer... Riley Bray. We make up the Bigfoot Collectors Club. That's right. Every week we talk to actors, comedians, writers, and paranormal experts about their personal paranormal histories and share stories of high strangeness. Like the time when we talked to Craig Ferguson about the Loch Ness Monster and when a sea witch told him he had raven magic. Or the time I asked Pitch Perfect's Anna Camp her opinion on cattle mutilations. Past guests have included Rachel Bloom, Jen Kirkman, Paul F. Tompkins, Bobcat Goldthwait, and more. So if you've ever been abducted alongside five reindeer by an alien with drills for hands, or witnessed Bigfoot crawl out of an interdimensional portal, don't laugh, happens all the time, then check out Bigfoot Collectors Club on Campfire Media or wherever you get your podcasts. Bigfoot Bigfoot Collectors Club, Club. you're You're here here to to believe believe us. Wait, is that how it goes? Campfire.